So basically, I explained the components of the food, right? What fishes eat in the ocean. And I know it sounds nasty. Um, so you know, the point is for you to, to get you to start to think on, you know, um, what and how you can, how you can get this, um, you know, for your fish, if that's something you're, you're looking into. All the several ways, the substitutes, right? So we're not wasting resources on unnecessary Necessary items or product. Um, so components of, of food crossed out. Uh, so now, how do you make the food? Um, so one key thing is the percentage, right? Percentage. So we have to have. It's up to you, right? How much percentage of protein? fat and carbohydrates well we also throw in vitamins right so percentage how much so basically or just that percentage is let's say 100 percent let's say 100 percent right let's say this is 100 it costs 100 so we can decide to say um, you want out of this hundred, you can decide to say you want uh, 30, 30, 35, uh, 5. So 30% plus uh, thirty percent to be protein. Thirty percent can be fat. Thirty thirty-five percent can be carbohydrate, and then five percent vitamins. It's up to you. Whatever formula you want, however you want to feed your fish, right? This is what this is the differences in our you know how several farms flourishes. Now you might go to you know some farms, and the pro protein would be here maybe. 10% because protein is expensive and hard to get. And then fat might be 40%. And this might be 35%. In the, let me just be honest with you. That, would, that, wouldn't be, that might not be so sweet because we want something that's kind of either balanced or we want higher protein. Right? We want either higher protein or something balanced. So it's up to you depending on how much you can have, how, you know, what you can afford, right? Um, then you can decide, you can make your, your formula on how you want to, um, how you want to, uh, your components, the components of your food. So then once you have this, without wasting any time, right? This is a shortcut to making your food, right? A lot, I've seen some, several different ways of making your food. But what I'm going to tell you is this. If you don't understand this, hopefully you understand how to bake. Right? And it's the same concepts, the same processes of baking that we're going to use and apply here in making this uh, fish food. Because like I said in, in the previously, um, carbohydrate is a binder. It swells. It rises. Carbohydrate, you know, carbohydrate includes rice, flour, cassava. They, they, it rises, right? And you have your protein and you have your fat. So the carbohydrate is what's going to keep it all together. Right, so basically, um, you can choose to you can choose to use. I like to use a blender. So basically, I recommend going for an industrial blender. Industrial blender, or industrial blender, or a blender that <laughs> a blender that is is very strong, right? Not you, because when you're throwing in your protein components, you're getting your protein from very rough places, right? So your protein can be insects, right? So you need a blender that can blend insects. You need a blender that... Now, I recommend don't use this blender for your kitchen uh, cooking. This blender is going to be for your, fat, uh, your fish food, right? So, <laughs> please. <laughs> so basically, this protein, right, would, would be could be insects, it could be blood or bodily uh, fluids, uh, blood products, 
it could be uh, meat. So you can imagine how powerful you need the blender to be in order to blend this protein, right? So then you have your red oil that you're going to throw in there, right? I recommend using a lower percentage for red oil because, anyways, and I explain that because a lot of times, right, why I, why I recommend using a lower percentage is I'll get that, I'll get back, to, I'll get to that, second to that, right? <laughs> but, um, and then your carbohydrates, you all throw it in the blender, right? Throw some, a little bit of water in there. You're going to get rid of the water anyways, but you need to throw in water so it can blend, right? And blend to smooth. So we want it to be very smooth, almost as if you're about to blend, uh, bake, right? So you're mixing up your protein, your fat, your oil, your carbohydrate, and your vitamins together to make a very li liquid, semi-liquid um, uh, dough. Which, after you've made that, then you can now bake it. You now get a next thing you need is going to need an oven. So, when you get an oven, you're going to bake just like you bake bread. So, um, a lot of people might, might say get a pellet, a pellet machine. You know, now, we're trying to save money here, you know, save cost, right? So, it, it's up to you. You can get a pellet machine, you know, and use that. Um, but it's expensive, usually. But if you get an oven here, what you can do is... When you bake it, dry it out. Because here's the key thing. The, the truth is this. When water, water is what makes food go, go bad, right? So just like our food go bad, this fish food that we're trying to make can also go bad. So we want it to be in a cool, dry place. That's why you see most labeling will say store in a cool, dry environment. Because once moisture gets in, even some labeling will say finish after you open it, after seven days. Because once, once it's exposed to moisture, you start to, it's, it starts to culture in microorganisms and bacteria that can now make this food that you just made to spoil or to go bad, right? Or to expire. <laughs> so what we're trying, because everything is, in life is trying to eat everything, right? So what we're trying to do is to preserve it or keep it long enough to where only our fish eats what we make. We don't want to make our fish for some fungi to come and grow in, on it and eat it, right? Or so... So the point is, water a lot of times is what encourages this this um, this spoiling. So we want to remove water. If you think about our local food that we eat, you know, back home, a lot of times I have food like kilishi, right? They take out the water, they dry it out, right? Even in the fridge, you know, sometimes you have a food stored in the fridge and you see water is coming, to, beginning to form, grow on the 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 food. You ask yourself, where's this water from? Right? You want to pour away that water, that top layer of water in the fridge of your food. Because that, once that water from the atmosphere settles into the food, it will then allow for microorganisms to, to, uh, to grow and flourish in that food. And that's how it now starts to spoil. So when you bake, inside of the food, right, there's water. So we're trying to dry out that water. Now, if you don't have, if you can't afford an oven, right, after you've done all this and you blended it, Right? A lot of people will then sun dry it. You want to sun dry it, but then you're sun drying it, you know, you, you now risk exposure because this is a delicacy. Birds want to eat it. So many things might want to eat what because you you blended protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamins. This is not only fishes want to eat this food. Right? So if you put it outside, rodents, rats can go after it. Uh, uh, birds can go after it. You know, so even bats, so many different things can want to eat it. Even other insects might want to eat it. So it's easier and faster to, after you blend it, take it into the oven, instead of putting it in the sun, dry it out, and then depending on how small your fishes are, you can now determine how you want to crush them up or break them up, right? There are several machines that can break the things up for you, right? There are several uh, pellets pellet making machines so depending on how you want to um break them up that's that's up to you right um so now another thing i need to explain is 
now that you've made the food, right, um, there's, there's, there's two things that affect, okay, let's, I have, to, I have to draw this. So let's say this is the water. Right? Let's say this is a basin of water. Right? And then you have your little fishes here. I know fishes look more prettier than this, but I'm just using this as a net to indicate. I have your fishes in the water, right? Um, when the fishes are small, catfishes, usually you have your juveniles. If you have your juveniles, fingerlings and juveniles. So fingerlings are smaller, right? Fingerlings, juveniles, and then adults, right? You have adults. So depending on where you specialize, where you want to focus on, right? Um, fingerlings are very small. You have a juvenile. So now here's one key thing you need to understand, right? In water, right? Just like in the ocean, the lower you get down here, the denser the water. What happens? So heavier nutrients, because water composes of several minerals in the ocean. Even if you just put water stationary for a long time, you see some separations that happen naturally. Right? Sometimes this top layer is warm, is hot. This part can be hot. This part can be warm. This part can be cold. And just this separation, right, allows for several organisms to flourish. So some organisms that will flourish here will die here, and some that will die here would flourish here. Right? And vice versa, and in the middle. So, we need to understand this phenomenon when we are starting a pond. That there is a separation that will happen naturally. When you throw in salt into this water, the salt is coming down to this bottom part. Right? The salt is coming down to this bottom part. So, the more salt you throw into this water, the more this bottom part will be concentrated with salt. So this part will be more, this part will be more tenacious. This part will be more the, the what's it called? Uh, velocity, right? This part will be more viscous. This part will be more tenacious and hard water. It's called hard water. This part will be, will be soft. Soft water, right? This part is harder. So the lower you go, the harder the water. Why does it make it harder? Because we have minerals and nutrients and so many different things, dead things, they come down here and they make this part more hard. Now, here's the problem. When you're opening a catfish, a lot of people will say, oh, my fish just died. My small, your, the fishes tend to die fast. Why? Because these fishes, they are small fishes. Let's say these fishes are Let's say these fishes are juveniles, right? See how small they are. For them to, for this fish to travel from here all the way up here, that's a long drive. That's a long journey, a long drive, right? It will use a lot of energy. If it's going from traveling from here to here, it can die in that process. It can die in this process of coming here, coming, going up and down, right? Now, you throw in the food. You throw in your food, right? And the food comes in here. Now, the food right then falls to the bottom here right so now all the fishes right rush down here to eat this food you just throw in food and all the fishes rush down here to eat this food so here's the problem with that is that these fishes are still very dumb and they are still very young so they don't have so much of common sense so they will focus on eating and forget that they need to breathe and then the more all of them pack down here, the more you have lesser oxygen here because there's oxygen in the water, right? But then even though there's oxygen in the water, because you have other gases that are heavier than oxygen down here, 
it would disp dispel and push oxygen to the higher part of the water. Let's say this is the basin, but the same concept applies in the ocean. So that's why sometimes you see a fish will come up here, right? To come and breathe. You see a fish will come up here to the top of the water to come and breathe. Not that there's no oxygen here, but depending on the concentration or if it is suffocating, it wants to come up to the where there is easy oxygen, a very readily available oxygen, which is the very top. But the problem is that if it stays up here, right, there's two things that is a problem. Most of the food is coming down to this part, so it's going to miss out on the party. That's the problem. And then secondly, when it stays up here, it, is, it allows rooms for, 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 for predators, for birds, right? For birds. <laughs> And so it allows room for birds to come and grab it. So, and that's life. So it needs to come up here to get better oxygen, but at the same time, it needs to avoid predators who we'll help them avoid predators. But another key problem is then they forget to eat. So now the, the solution now is this. How can we help this fish to eat better without having to come down here and suffocate for lack of oxygen. Which is why we now make, this, which is why the composition of protein, fat, and carbohydrate and vitamins is needed to be understood. Because depending on how we make, depending on the concentration, depending on the percentages we use here, will determine whether or not this, this food will fall to the bottom or it will stay up here. Hopefully that's making sense. So, if you think about it for a sec, when you think about uh, dumplings or uh, puff puff, different different between puff puff and donuts, or people between puff puff and buns. Buns is dense. When you drop buns in the water, it will fall down to the bottom. When you drop puff puff, puff puff will float on top. But puff puff has less protein. It has more flour, more carbohydrate. So we want to make when it is small, when the fishes are still very young. When the fish are still very young, we want to make their food to have more carbohydrates so that that way it will float. Hopefully that makes sense. We, we, we want the food to have more carbohydrates so that the food can float because carbohydrate is lighter, right? And it will allow for water to, you know, it's lighter than protein and fat. So now, the fish, the, the fish should be able to stay up here, eat and breathe at the same time. And then we can now protect it from these birds by putting a roof here or a canopy or a net. You can put a net or canopy or roof, whatever it is, however you want to construct your pond, right? So we're problem solving here, right? So we've eliminated this predator. The birds. These are the birds in the, in, the, in the sky, right? I know my drawing is congested, but hopefully it make, it's making sense. So now, now these small fishes have um, a higher chance of survival because they're not wasting energy in going up and down. Energy they're supposed to use to grow, they're using it to grow. Okay, so now, another key thing that is important is the temperature. Right? How do we balance out the temperature here? We need to measure the temperature here to make sure that there is equilibrium. We want equilibrium. Equilibrium. Right? So depending on how you want to construct your pond, you can construct your pond in such a way that the tap the tap that is flowing into this pond, you set it right here in the middle. So that that way, as it is flowing in, it is evenly distributed between the top and the bottom through um, osmosis and diffusion, right? We can also put metals, things here. We can put metal rods, right? That will go from the bottom here all the way to the top to help to break into the water 
to allow things to flow. Right? So, uh, another key thing that we need to keep in mind is this protein, when we are feeding these fishes, right, our food, we want to feed them the right amount of food because we don't want any excess or any rediment in this water. Why? Because I will explain to you, like I explained earlier, the components of protein has, it has nitrogen. So once it's broken down, this nitrogen in this water in excess is toxic because the fish will breathe in nitrogen instead of oxygen because nitrogen is lighter than oxygen. So now we want to However, they need this protein. So, it's, it's a double-edged knife, right? It's a double-edged knife. They need this protein to grow. They need this fat, right? Same thing with the fat. They need it to grow. But fat is, in, the, in, the, in excess here, is poisonous to the fish because fat and water don't mix. They can't breathe fat. They can't breathe through fat. It is too dense. It increases the density of the water. They can't breathe through it. It's toxic. There are some acid, there are some OH, there are some OH molecules. OH molecules in fat that is acidic. There's also some, you know, carboxyl in, in protein, right? The carboxyl group is acidic. So this acid, right, it can die from excess acid and can also die from suffocation due to nitrogen that has a lower affinity than oxygen. So now we want, how do we solve this problem, right? We want to create, put a tap here, op make an opening here and create a tap here that is connected to this pond. So that way it can flow out from the bottom here. Because this, ha this part has the most dense part of the, you know, the water. We, we want it to flow out here. Right? And we can also create another tap here where it can flow out here. Because sometimes you see oil at the top of the water. So oil tends to settle at the top. Right? And then, you know, other dense Minerals and other things, sometimes the oil too, they want to settle here. So we can interchange, interswitch where we empty this water from, right? But it's important not to feed them in excess because sometimes some people think if I feed excess, my fish will grow faster and grow bigger. And then once this thing, once this food stays in this water for too long, right? It is because the, the, the food is. The, the food is permeable. It is, it is permeable. So the water would eventually dis, 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 begin to disintegrate and dissolve the food. Once it dissolves this food, then you now have protein, fat, and carbohydrate and excess of, they become toxic inside here. Moreover, this fish is also producing its own feces. It also has its own excretion. And in its own feces, it also has nitrogen. So now you're having nitrogen that has been degraded from protein. You're having fat. You're having all this excess plus its own excretion inside this water. So the rate of change into a toxic environment will be faster than what you expect. Because it is constantly going to be shitting and peeing and excreting, right? So we want to make sure that we have constant outflow of toxic water. I recommend just having a recommended outflow, right? Just like the river. The river is non-stop flowing. So what we can do is have a tap here and open it slowly, right? So that way there's continuous outflow. So there will never be a build up of toxins, right? So a lot of people want to change suddenly, but think about it, right? Just imagine your, the, the, your environment. You are at 70 degrees Celsius. Right? Uh, sorry, set 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. <laughs> or let's just say 32 degrees Celsius. Right? Or whatever it is, whatever temperature you want. And then all of a sudden, 
somebody comes in here and just empties out all this water and brings in a brand new water that you're not used to. Even if it is the same water, you don't know where the water is coming from, you might not be able to breathe. Just imagine me just changing your environment suddenly, right? What do you have? You have jet lag, right? When you go from Africa to America, you have jet lag. You, even if it is daytime, you still feel tired, right? <laughs> because of jet lag. So the same phenomenon, the same things, principles apply to these fishes. So when we do things like that, right, we are we have stressed them. We don't want to stress them. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but I'm, I'm explaining it so we can know that they can be stressed too. So now you're stressing them. When they are stressed, they don't want to eat. They don't want to move. They're not active. You say, oh, what's going on with my fishes? Yeah, you just stress them. You just change their water suddenly and you change the excess. Or maybe you did some separation. Maybe you're trying to separate the big fish from the small fish. Now they're tired. Or you move them from one pond to another pond. It's a new environment. They're tired. And you're like, well, it's the same water. Yes, it's the same water, but it's a different environment. So I see they traveled how many kilometers away. They have to adapt and adjust to the environment. So now, when, once that happens, we recommend for that not to happen. But in situations where we don't have a choice and that happens, right, we have to give them time, at least 8 hours to 24 hours for them to adjust before you can now feed them. Because if, if not, you're just wasting feed. And mind you, you put money into this feed, right? So we're trying to, we're trying to, um, we're trying to break even, we're trying to make profit here. And you're now you're feeding them when you know that they can't eat that food. What happens is that feed will end up being dissolved by the water and then we'll just, we'll just flush it out. We'll just flush it out and it's a waste. So we have to give them time until they're active and ready to eat. Usually the recommended time to eat is in the morning, right? When the sun is out. Just like us, it's not recommended to, nobody wants to, well, some people eat at night, but the normal order of things is everybody's active and busy when the sun is out. The sun is a source of energy, and when the sun is out, that's when everybody's active and busy, and that's when we want to eat. Some people, you know, eating at night has been proven not to be um, very healthy. <laughs> so, we don't want to feed the fishes at night. Okay, so we talked about the temperature. We'll, we can use poles right and having the right tap in the right places right in in the right input of water and the right places and the right output of water in the right places would help to regulate the temperature why is this temperature important do you know okay think about this when you boil egg protein denatures in the presence of heat protein would lose its nature right so when you boil when egg is you get egg egg is in liquid semi-liquid form you boil it, increase the heat, and it becomes solid, right? So now it becomes solid. The same thing applies to the fish brain, the fish. If it is too hot, right, or cold, it affects the mood, right? Because some people have heat stroke. Fishes too can stroke out when it's too hot. You just imagine putting a fish in a boiling water. What happens? It, it, it will stroke out. It will... It, 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 it's, it's, it sounds sociopathic, but that's what happens, right? So we don't want to put it in the boiling water. We want to have the right temperature of water, right? Also, the, the younger it is, the less tolerance it has for harsh weather temperature, so weather condition. You know, just um, we, like we store our egg in the fridge, Right? When the fishes are young, even at childbirth, we want a cool environment. Because when it's warm, it won't hatch. It will denature. It will just freeze up. It will, it will just become like rock, like an egg. So we want it, uh, in order for life to flourish, we want it in a cool, cool environment. Once it has hatched, they will now slowly ease it into a warm environment, which is very tricky. Because we like warm weather, but for us to come and survive as, as um, newborns, a cooler environment is required a lot of times, right? The whole em the environment is cooler. And if you look at that, you see that even, even in the sperm, you see they store, the, they store sperm, human sperm in the fridge. They tell you like your sperm is much more active and more vile when it is cold compared to when it is warm, which is why when it is warm, the, the scrotum descends, the scrotum falls down. 
because it is trying to separate itself from the heat of the body. It wants to be cool. So you are more fertile as a man, as a male, you're more fertile, you know, when your, your eggs are cool. Same concept applies to, you know, uh, fish when they are small, when they are young as eggs. But that's just, by the way, uh, knowledge. So let's see if I'm missing anything. Um, another important thing that we need to know is how many fishes go in here? There's a formula for that. How many fishes go, can fit in here? We have to make sure we have the right amount of fishes depending on the, its environment. You, know, you multiply it by its square foot. There is a generally acceptable, um, because you don't want this place to be clustered with fishes. Because what will happen is they begin to attack themselves. These fishes are, remember I said they, are cannib they, are, they, are, they have this cannibalism nature. Right? And they are omnivores. So they sometimes they eat themselves. And you want a small fish to be able to run away from a bigger fish. Even though they are all catfishes, there will be one that will be getting bigger than a smaller one. If they are all together, the chances of escaping will be rare. You're just going to be in my face and you're small, then the big one just eats the small one because it's right there in its face. There's no space for that one to run away to. So you want there to be room, right? So they can survive. So there's a formula for that. that I think um, I'm going to stop here for right now. Um, I will share more. Um, if more comes to mind at another class, I would definitely, but feel free to drop your comments or ask questions and I will revisit. Um, I'm sharing my knowledge as a scientist and um, a scholar. And uh, I like to say I'm an ape trying to teach another ape how to survive. I'm not an expert. <laughs> Thank you very much.